Check this out from NBC News right now. Dog heart disease linked to grain-free problems. Bloomberg, dog food with legumes could be the problem. The New York Times, popular grain-free dog food. There's Time Magazine. The messages are mixed everywhere. Nobody really knows what is going on. We traveled halfway across the world to talk to one of the experts in the field of lectins, Dr. Gundry. He's a heart doctor, cardiologist, but he's also an expert in what are called lectins. And so we brought him on today to help explain that. When you have to assemble kibble or pet food today, it can't be done without starch. So the manufacturers need something to stick that together. You want that crunchy hard ball, we're gonna have to add something. Early on, a lot of these pet foods were heavily corn-based, a lot of rice and wheat mm -hmm. and then of course as social media took off and people started educating themselves and the public started demanding something different we no longer want these anymore we want a better source of pet food so manufacturers were forced to have to shift those diets and now they're starting to venture into a lot of legumes and some of these diets can be up to the way of 60 percent legumes where a dog and cat are eating these day in and day out so this is why it was important that we thought we would bring up legumes. All of us are wondering when Dr. Stern said, listen, we're identifying this problem primarily with grain-free products, which means legume robust products by default or potatoes, but help us connect the dots on how would a person acquire heart disease by eating legumes. What lectins do is they actually create leaky gut. Hippocrates, 2,500 years ago, said all disease begins in the gut. One of the primary purposes of lectins are to bind to sugar molecules on the wall of the gut, whether it's humans, whether it's a dog or a cat, and pry the wall of the gut open. And then not only do lectins get through the wall of the gut, and they're a foreign protein, but probably equally as important, bacterial particles also get through the wall of the gut. And our immune system recognizes these things as foreign. We know now that several of these particles bind to vessel surfaces of humans, and I suspect yep. other animals, and cause inflammation on blood vessels themselves. One of the first things I do in a patient with a dilated cardiomyopathy is I take lectins away from them and we have an excellent result. So for your human DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy patients, that you're doing these lectin sensitivity blood tests on, what's the correlation of 50%, 20%, 80% in your experience? So I think longer I've been doing this, all humans are sensitive in one way or another to lectins. I'll give you another example. I just stumbled on a paper from Ohio State. They actually proved that putting soybeans in a chicken diet, you will find the soybean pseudoestrogens and then you will find the soybean lectins in the chicken meat. In humans, if you are hugely lectin sensitive and if you're still eating factory farm meat, could you still see a problem? Oh, absolutely. You are what you eat, but you are what the thing you're eating ate. What we've had up until the last 50 years is a fairly sophisticated defense system against plant lectins. There's, there's been a balance of power, and that balance of power includes acid in your stomach, which is effective at breaking down proteins, which are lectins. Second is the mucus barrier in, that lines our gut. Uh, that's been completely broken down. Third thing is our microbiome. Our, Believe it or not, our microbiome, the bacteria, love lectin-containing foods. And if you stop eating gluten, for instance, which is a lectin, and that bacteria has nothing to eat, it leaves. And then you re-challenge yourself with gluten, and you got you don't have the guy there to eat it anymore. So you're kind of doubly sensitive. What what would your suggestion be? And it would be to add in things that help repair the gut walls. Exactly, that's exactly right. Now, here's the thing that I think is missing in all of your discussions, and that is glyphosate, which is Roundup. And we now know, thanks to Dr. Schiff from MIT, that shows that Roundup glyphosate is a direct cause of leaky gut. You don't need anything else to do it. And all of our food, are full of glyphosate. The pet 
food situations even worse. So there's feed grade and food grade. And unless your pet food is labeled as human grade, it is not. It's feed grade, which means rejected and recycled from the human industry. So animals are actually about twice as toxic as people when it comes to glyphosate load. Shocking, but true. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about touring. One of the things that in veterinary medicine we've realized, kitties have to have taurine supply directly from their diet. They cannot manufacture it. Dogs, if in theory, if provided the appropriate amino acids, can. What about people? Can people manufacture their own taurine or they need to eat it? They can manufacture their own taurine, but interestingly enough, we see a number of patients, particularly with cardiomyopathy, that giving them taurine additional couple times a day, we can actually measure improvement in heart function. Can you talk to me a little bit about this concept of taurine? Taurine can come directly from meat, or if there's enough cysteine and methionine, dogs will make it themselves. But here's my question. If you're providing just, let's say, synthetic amino acids and vegan pet food, cysteine and methionine, if you had a lectin in there, what do lectins in the guts of humans do when it comes to amino acid absorption? Is there anything or no issues there? A great question. So a human gut has a surface area the size of a tennis court. And we see in a number of our patients, we can measure that they have amino acid protein deficiencies because so much of their surface area of their gut has been destroyed. So in theory for people, you if you had an abundance of lectins, you may have a decrease in amino acid absorption in yeah. theory. We'll, well, yeah, we'll see people with very low proteins okay. and uh, low albumins. In my research, when we take lectin containing foods away from them, miracle of miracle, their albumins go up, their proteins go up. Why? Because they've now got a surface area to absorb It's protein. functional. It's functional. Okay. And that's one of the ways we look. Second question. Do lectins, there's been one theory out there that potentially taurine needs zinc and selenium. There's a whole system that requires taurine synthesis in the body. Do lectins block mineral absorption in people? Yeah, that's one of the ways lectins work. But Another compound in plants that are called uh, phytates are actually probably more important in blocking mineral absorption. But I think the thing we're forgetting is our soil is currently so deficient yep. of minerals that we could eat constantly and never be able to feed ourselves the adequate amount of minerals that we need. Even our Organic vegetables are grown in are yes. grown in nutrient depleted yep. soil, yep. and we're starting so far behind the curve. But. And this is a great point that you make because for a lot of pet parents out there, a lot of them want to feed an all meat based diet where they're just feeding meat, bone, and organ on the assumption that dogs in the wild, this is what they would have consumed hundreds of years ago. And we're seeing a lot of nutritional deficiencies today. And one of the big things that's highlighted in science is how meat itself, when you look all across the board, the decline in those minerals and those vitamins in meat, broccoli itself, 50% of calcium over the last 50 years is depleted. So yeah, great point. So we understand that lectins found in legumes damage the gut wall, create massive inflammation, and in turn can be damaging to the entire body. So potatoes have been implicated in this pet food issue. What's the problem with potatoes? Here's the problem with potato starch. And this, oh, again, talking about a human. Yep, of course. So potato starch got very popular a few years ago as the gut microbiome was discovered. And we realized that the gut microbiome is dependent on what are called resistant starches for their nourishment. There's essentially two groups of bacteria, beneficial and harmful. Potato starch feeds harmful bacteria. Harmful bacteria in turn make more of these funny little cell walls called LPSs that produce inflammation. There was a big movement to use potato starch to feed the gut microbiome and then there was this huge time out about eight years ago now and said, Oops, yeah. our entire recommendation about potato starch was, was completely wrong. Maybe that the lectins are destroyed, but where we may have been wrong, at least in humans, is thinking that's a good starch and it's not okay, a good starch. got it. What we're missing in part of the nutrition of dogs and cats is in the wild, of course, they're eating the whole animal and they're, they're absolutely eating the intestinal contents. And maybe what we've missed in, in dogs talking as a human, I know that what's missing in many humans is we have not enriched our intestinal microbiome. 
this goes back really to gut health. So pet food industry, if you wanted to take advice from a human cardiologist, we should be looking at gut health. I mean, that's that's a nice suggestion for our industry because we could not agree more. Right. Yeah, we could not right. agree more.